Hello, my name is Melissa Silvis of Melissa Silvis Ministries, and this is lesson four in our five-week study on integrity. Integrity is so severely lacking in this day and age, and it's because there aren't a lot of people who are holding themselves to the standard of the character of Jesus Christ. We need to be operating in a greater level of honesty, total loyalty to God, and obedience to God according to his word. It isn't about the standards that other people would set for you or even that you would set for yourself. But instead, we have to get into line with the standards that God has given us. That means that we can't get, be caught behaving badly. A lot of times people believe that they can hold on to something in their heart and no one will ever know. But it tells us in the word of God that's what within you is eventually going to come out of you. And what you think is super secret about how you don't like someone or what you think about a certain situation that in the right opportunity where life presses on you or something challenging happens and you feel provoked, it's going to come up and it's going to come out. But a man or a woman of integrity is not somebody who knows how to tuck those things down really good and keep them secret. It's someone who doesn't carry those things at all. In the word of God, God tells us that we must forgive completely and quickly. That in fact, we must forgive if we are going to be forgiven. If you want to walk in a right relationship with God, if you want to be a man or woman of integrity, you got to clean out all the closets in your life. You can't hold on to those things. And look, it doesn't mean that those things don't matter. Look at what Joseph walked through in his life. If you've seen our uh, previous lessons, you see that Joseph's brothers hated him because he was favored by their father. Joseph's brothers thought about killing him. But then they decided that they wouldn't bloody their hands and they would just sell him into slavery instead. But they walked out a deception to make their father believe that Joseph had been ripped apart by wild animals and had died. And it destroyed his heart. And he went into deep mourning that he never really recovered from. It led him into great fear where he was very controlling of Joseph's only fully natural brother, his younger brother, Benjamin. And he wouldn't let him out of his sight. He wouldn't let him live a normal life. And lots of hard things were going on in Joseph's family. But it was no excuse for the way that they treated him. But Joseph chose to always walk the high road, to walk in integrity, to never retaliate, to not be a grumbler or a complainer. He didn't have a hard heart. He wasn't operating out of unforgiveness. He wasn't telling everybody the story of what everyone had done to him. Look, the sinner will be held accountable for their sin. If they are broken man's law, then they have a right to be held accountable against that law. And if they have broken the laws of God, they will not get away with their evil either because God will hold them accountable. And even if they repent, many of them still have to walk out the natural consequences of the life that they've chosen. If we look in First and Second Samuel and we look at the line of kings, when Israel, the nation of Israel, came to God and said, we want an earthly king like other nations have, they gave him a man named Saul. And Saul was tall and handsome and broad-shouldered. And he was of the uh, lineage of Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. And so the line of kings could have come down through Benjamin. But Saul was prideful. He was arrogant. And he operated in rebellion. He had a way of only doing part of what God commanded him to do. And yet he declared out of his mouth, I've done everything that God told me to do. And yet he never, ever did. And so God ripped the kingdom out of Saul's hands. And his family, for the most part, passes away. And Saul and all of his sons are killed at the same, about the same time they all die. And there's not much of his family left in Israel at all. And God raises up another king. And his name is David. And David made a, a fatal mistake. He did what he shouldn't be doing. He stayed home from the war. He stayed home and he was idle when he should have been out at war like all the kings were at home doing his own thing. And that's when he spied someone else's wife, decided he wanted her, took her. And then when she became pregnant, like Joseph's brothers trying to cover up their sin of selling him into slavery, 
David tried to cover up his sin by having Bathsheba's husband come home from the war. But then when he refused to sleep in the house with her because all the other men were out at war away from their wives, David hatched a plot to murder him. And it cost David greatly. The child that Bathsheba was pregnant with died. And one of other, David's other sons tried to take over the kingdom. Well, David repented and he got right with God. But it didn't mean that there weren't consequences for his sin. The next son that Bathsheba had was Solomon. And he became the wisest king that there ever was. But God told him up front, if you don't serve me with integrity and faithfulness, if you begin to worship false idols and take foreign wives and move away from total undivided loyalty to me, it will cost you. And so it did. Solomon rejected his loyalty to God. He compromised his integrity to have all of these foreign wives, and he never repented of his sin. And at the end of his life, God said to him, your children will walk out the consequences for the choices that you made. And this kingdom that was one kingdom united under one king will be split into two kingdoms in a way from which it will never recover. And so Solomon's sons saw this and they walked in wickedness before the Lord. Solomon's son who was a king after Solomon and the kingdom was ripped into and it never recovered. And the consequences of one man who will not repent trickle down through thousands of years of Israelite people. We cannot minimize the sin of our own life and say, I'm hurting nobody but me. It's my life and I'll do what I please. You leave a legacy whether you like it or not. And that legacy is either one of integrity and obedience and loyalty to God that is not a guarantee that your children will behave properly and honor God as well, but at least you will go to the grave blameless knowing that you have walked rightly with God and you've done everything in your power to put them on the right path with a God who wants to bless them and show them his favor. And they can never say that they don't know what a life of integrity before God looks like because they will always remember the man or the woman you chose to be. Even when there was opposition, even when everything didn't go your way, even when people falsely accused you, even when this world system that has fallen and broken and full of sin, even when your enemy Satan attacked and it looked like he was winning, what did you look like in the midst of all of that? Joseph had nobody that stood by his side. His mother died giving birth to his younger brother, and he was left basically in the family alone. Sure, he was the favorite of their father, but their father had tunnel vision and didn't pay any attention to how he was creating strife between his sons through his favoritism. And he didn't hold his evil sons accountable for the way that they treated their brother either. He was not the disciplinarian, the man of God he should have been especially when we see how he repented of his own sin and got into a right relationship with God. But through other circumstances, he had areas of weakness. He did not walk in total integrity. And those compromises created fractions in his life. And those things continued to carry out paths that allowed the enemy to take his family and to fragment them. And his sons were not the men that they should have been. Otherwise, they couldn't have sold their brother into slavery somehow this one young man joseph rose above all the strife in his family and he walked in total integrity to god and he never compromised himself well just like uh david was idle and he was at home and he wasn't doing what he was supposed to be doing and his idleness led to sin Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, and his master, Potiphar's wife, she was a woman of leisure. She didn't have to cook, and she didn't have to clean, and she didn't have to take care of the house. She didn't have to do all the things that a normal wife had to do because her husband kept her in a very nice style. They were very wealthy, and her idleness led to sin. And she tried to entice Joseph to come and to sleep with her. But because Joseph was a man of integrity, even when no one was watching, even when everybody else was under his authority and he could have told them all to be quiet and he could have done whatever she wanted, 
He said, I will not do this wickedness before God. My master has put everything he owns into my hands. He trusts me and I will not betray his loyalty. A man and woman of integrity walk in integrity whether everyone sees what they're doing or not. Even if someone could come to you and guarantee that no one would ever know what you did behind closed doors, God knows and you know. And Joseph knew that he had to stay loyal to God. If he was going to survive in a foreign country as a slave, he was going to have to honor God with the life that he lived and the choices that he made. And so he worked hard for his master until he was promoted to a place of authority where he was the second in everything his master owned. But then, when he would not sleep with his master's wife, she falsely accused him, and he was thrown into the very dungeon below the house he had once run and been in total authority over. Sometimes it looks like the enemy is winning, but that's why we must trust God and not allow what circumstances around us look like to dictate who we believe God is and whether or not he's happy with us. We live in a broken, fallen world. Satan's trying all the time to destroy you. And if he can't get you not to follow God, he's going to try and ruin your reputation and say, you're not who you say you are. We talked last week about abstaining from all appearance of evil, making sure that I'm not caught where I'm not supposed to be and in a situation that could be even misconstrued as being evil or deceptive or dishonest. We've got to walk integrity before God. Integrity does this. It thinks about the results or consequences before it takes action and doesn't wait to see how things will work out after the fact. A man or woman of integrity thinks about what their words will create around them. Have you ever walked into a situation where you started to complain or to gossip and everybody in the room picked up on the atmosphere that you created? You brought that and you're accountable for it. A man or woman of integrity does not conceal. They deal with everything and they take it to God. They repent quickly of their own sin, their own actions and attitudes that are wrong. They take responsibility because no matter how much integrity you have, you are not perfect and you will never be perfect in this life. But we are being perfected by the hand of God as we walk in obedience and submission to him. Joseph was learning. If he had all the wisdom and integrity that he needed, he would have never allowed himself to be caught in the house alone with Potiphar's wife. But he learned from that situation. And even he took responsibility for the areas where he needed to grow. But when Potiphar threw him into the prison, Joseph didn't sit in the prison and say, Poor me, I just don't even deserve this. But instead he walked in integrity. And he made the best of every situation. Every season Joseph found himself in was a place for God to be glorified. And if you can't say that about your life, then you need to look at your character and you need to wonder who your master really is. Are you living to please yourself? Or are you living to please God? Well, let's begin with Psalm 25, verses 8 through 21. Once again, if you've been with us for the other le- lessons, you know that I'm reading to you from the Psalms, Psalms that David wrote in challenging situations and seasons in his life but they sound like they could also be the voice of Joseph. And so this week, Psalm 25, 8 through 21 reads this way. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches the sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his ways. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth. To to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O God, pardon my iniquity. For it is great. Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. It looks like it got worse instead of better, right? He's in the prison. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies for they are many and they hate me with cruel hatred. 
Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait on you. Joseph was in prison, a prison he didn't choose, a prison he didn't deserve. But he kept his eyes on God, and he continued to be a man of great integrity. Somehow, with the favor of God on him, he worked his way up through the ranks in that prison. I believe in the beginning that he was not treated well. Look, he was the newest prisoner in the dungeon of the, the prison keeper's master, uh, Potiphar. And so I'm sure that he was not treated well by the people who worked in the prison because he was there because he was falsely accused. Well, they didn't know he was falsely accused, but because he was accused of messing with the boss's wife. So I'm sure that they were hard on him. But because Joseph was a man of integrity and because favor with God, like we saw in Proverbs last week, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Look, you could work really hard to make everybody who doesn't like you like you. And you may end up compromising your integrity before God to try and please man. Because the en enemy always wants to manipulate us that way. Well, if we please everybody, there will be pe peace around us. But it's not real peace. It's a false peace because it's a peace that only exists when you do what pleases man. But when you get your eyes off those things, when instead you trust in God and you lean not on your own understanding, but you acknowledge him, you walk in integrity in all things, God can reverse those situations. And because you please him, he can give you favor with people who used to be enemies. He can create real peace with those people. So Joseph worked hard in that prison, and he worked his way up, and the keeper of the prison saw the hand of God on Joseph's life, and he made him in charge of the whole prison underneath him. Once again, he was second in authority. When Joseph was at home with his father Jacob, he wore a coat of many colors, signifying himself as the firstborn. And no one in his father's house did, jo did Jacob trust like he trusted Joseph. And his brothers hated him for it, but Joseph had a place of distinction, of favor, and he was in second in authority in his father's house in a lot of ways because he was signified as the firstborn because of Reuben's sin. And then he was sold into slavery and he went into Potiphar's house. And in Potiphar's house, what happened? He got a new robe, a robe of authority as a high-ranking servant, and he became the second in command over everything that Potiphar owned. And then Potiphar's wife accused him, grabbed his coat. And Joseph got a change of garment again. He went into the prison and wore the garment of a prisoner. And yet, in that place as well, God gave him favor. And once again, he became the second in command and authority in that place. See, when you begin to look at things like that, you see that Joseph's life didn't go up and down. It went through different seasons, and sometimes the circumstances looked good, and sometimes they looked really bad. But Joseph was always the same man because he said, God, teach me your ways. Keep me on the right path. He, I see that my troubles of my heart have enlarged. It looks like it's gotten worse. Yet God, I am preserved by you and I wait on you. A life of integrity is one that is not dictated by circumstances, but it's dictated by your loyalty, your obedience, your integrity before God to bring him glory in your heart and in your life, no matter what everyone else around you is doing. And so Joseph walked in total integrity before the Lord, and the Lord blessed him for it. And because he walked in total integrity, the day even came where God restored his favor with Potiphar. And last week we talked about how the uh, Pharaoh was angry with his chief butler and his chief baker and he threw them into the dungeon where Joseph was, the dungeon underneath Potiphar's house. And in Genesis chapter 40 verses 1 through 4, we see that Potiphar specifically comes to Joseph as the captain of the guard 
and puts those two prisoners under Joseph's care. Very important prisoners that would need to be well taken care of there because uh, most people would know that they wouldn't be there long because a lot of times kings would get angry with people that were close to them. And then they would stop being angry and they would bring them back. And so they needed to be well taken care of. And even though Potiphar had thrown Joseph into that dungeon, he had watched Joseph um, continue to walk in submission, humility, generosity, integrity, obedience. He didn't talk back. He didn't have a bad attitude. Even before his master, who didn't trust him anymore and whose uh, good you know, opinion he had lost at one point. But as Potiphar watched Joseph continue to be the same man behind bars that he had been when he was in charge of his house, the trust was restored. And Potiphar said, I want you to take care of these two men. And God did that because God was positioning Joseph for where he was going to take him next. And so one night these two men had dreams and God gave Joseph the interpretation that the chief butler would be restored in three days and that in three days the chief baker would be uh, put to death. And it all went down exactly the way that God had had Joseph tell them. And the butler went back to the palace and he was really glad to be back there. And he forgot all about his promise to Joseph that he would make Joseph known to the Pharaoh. And so for two more years, Joseph sat in that prison until one day the Pharaoh had two dreams. Habakkuk 2.3 reads this way, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now that's it in the King James Version, but if we bring it down into layman's terms, basically what this says is that the vision is for an appointed time, and in the end it will come to pass, and though it even looks like it may be delayed, wait for it, because it will come surely right on time. And Joseph may have wondered what happened to the butler. Maybe he thought, wow, this is great, three days, and I'm going to be out of this prison finally. And weeks passed and months passed, and even years passed. But Joseph continued to walk in total integrity before God, even though the butler didn't keep his promise, because God's promises are sure. Man's will surely fail you because people will make you all kinds of promises and they'll intend to keep them. But they just don't always do it. But God always keeps his promises. And so at the appointed time, God's perfect timing, Pharaoh had two dreams. And he had those dreams, and nobody could tell him what the dreams meant. The first of Pharaoh's two dreams we see in Genesis 41, 1 through 13, is that seven fine-looking fat cows came up out of the river and fed in a meadow. After them came up seven lean and hungry cows and ate them. Then the Pharaoh woke up, and he went back to sleep, and he fell asleep, and he dreamed again. In the second dream, seven heads of grain grew up on one stalk, and they were plump and good. But then seven thin and blighted heads sprung up after them and devoured them. In the morning, the Pharaoh woke up, and he was greatly troubled in his spirit. And he called for all his wise men, all of his magicians, but no one could interpret the dreams. And this is the point at which the butler remembers Joseph. And the butler spoke up and he said, I remember my faults this day when you, speaking to Pharaoh, when you were angry with your servants and put me in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, along with the chief baker, we each had a dream in one night. Now there was a young Hebrew man with us there, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him, and he interpreted our dreams for us. To each man he interpreted according to his own dream. And it came to pass just as he interpreted for us. So it happened. You restored me to my office, and you hanged the chief baker. Well, Pharaoh immediately called for Joseph out of the prison. And they quickly went and brought Joseph out of the prison, and he shaved, and they put another new garment on him, one that was better than his prison clothes, so that he was able to go into the presence of the Pharaoh so the Pharaoh could speak to him. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I've had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. But I have heard it said that you can interpret and understand my dream. 
So Joseph answered Pharaoh saying, it is not me. God will give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So Pharaoh shared the dreams with Joseph, but Joseph said, look, it's not me. It's God. God is the giver of the interpretation of dreams. The same thing he told the butler and the baker. A man of integrity doesn't take credit for God, what God does. Uh, the other day I was uh, talking to a friend and I, I wrote an article. I, I post on, um, on Facebook every day, a devotional blog. And I haven't posted this one yet. I, I have it set aside and I'll post it someday soon. But God was talking to me about the difference between flattery and encouragement. You know, Potiphar's wife tried to flatter Joseph. But flattery at its, at its core is control. It's got a spirit of control. A person flatters you because they want something in return. But a person who encourages you wants to encourage you because they see God in you. They aren't trying to flatter you. Oh, you're amazing. You're strong. You're, you know, you're fantastic. You do everything right. And they're flattering you because of what they want out of the situation. But a person who encourages you, they're basically saying, I praise God for who he is in you. I acknowledge that it's God working in you. And when you are a man or woman of integrity, you're not susceptible to flattery, even when someone tries to flatter you. And sometimes it will happen. God taught me that even when somebody tries to flatter me, that my response should be, praise God, he is so good. Thank you for the encouragement. See how you turn that around? By walking in integrity, even when people have wrong motives, when you have pure motives, you can stay off the enemy's attack. You can walk in wisdom and integrity yourself, no matter what other people are doing. So even when Pharaoh misspoke, Joseph was humble, I'm sure, but he corrected him and said, no, no, no. See, the gift is not mine. I'm not the answer to your problem. God is the solution. And that's what a man or woman of integrity does. They make sure that people are not admiring them like it's their gift, but instead they're always deflecting that back to God. Now, some people don't go too far the other way, and they're like, you know, oh, no, 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 and they won't take any encouragement. Look, God wants you to be encouraged because when you see God operating through you and other people see God operating through you, then it encourages you to be even more diligent even more obedient, walk in even more integrity because it feels good when you know that you please God and other people see you pleasing God. And so God, Joseph just wanted to get everything out there right. And so it's not wrong for people to encourage us. We can thank them for the encouragement, but we must also always redirect the glory to God because the glory belongs, belongs to God. Flattery tries to pin the glory to me. Encouragement tries to put the glory to God. Amen? That's the way that it should always be. And so Joseph said, I'm not the one who can interpret your dreams. That's God. And so Joseph explained both the dreams actually had the same meaning. God revealed to him what was about to happen. And that's what he did to Pharaoh. He gave him the dreams to show him what was about to happen. That there were about to be seven years of great plenty in the land, followed by seven years of famine that would severely deplete Egypt and all the surrounding countries as well. In Genesis 41, verses 33 through 36, Joseph says this, Now therefore let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this and let him appoint officers over the land to collect one-fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt in those seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh. And let them keep food in the cities. Then that food shall be as a reserve for the land for the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land may not perish during the famine. So Joseph said, this is the discernment, this is the wisdom you need. Find yourself a man who is wise, who knows how to follow orders. Have him set aside one-fifth of everything that's coming up, each of the harvests of those seven years, and there will be plenty of food when the famine comes. Joseph didn't say, I'm a man of great integrity and wisdom. Choose me. No, instead Joseph told Pharaoh what God told him to tell him. Promotion comes from the Lord. That's what it says in the word of God. 
See, if we have ambition, our uh, selfish ambition to promote ourselves, to try and create the life we want to have, to uh, create a path that we hope God will bless, you know, God makes us talented and intelligent people, we may be able to prosper for a while, but you're going to be compromising what you could be doing for God and instead creating a, a lesser kingdom for yourself instead of creating God's kingdom, God's way. A man or woman of integrity does not boast. A man or woman of integrity does not try and put themselves forward because of ambition. This could have been Joseph's ticket out of prison. But whether Joseph was going back to the prison or not, he was there to do what God had asked him to do. But when a man, when a man walks in integrity, God gives him favor with men. And so Pharaoh responded, and it says that Pharaoh and all of his servants liked the wisdom that Joseph spoke. And Pharaoh said, can we find a one as this, a man in whom is the spirit of God? Inasmuch as God has shown you all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you are. You shall be over my house and all people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took off his signet ring and he put it on Joseph's hand and he clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. And he had him ride in the second chariot, which he had, and they cried out as Joseph came by, bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Pharaoh also said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh and without your consent, no man may lift his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. Proverbs 22, 11 says, He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. And this is what proved to be true in the life of Joseph. He was sold into slavery, falsely accused, left in the prison for years. But in the fullness of time, God brought him up to be the second in the whole nation. Once again, a new coat, a new place of authority, the second in command. And Pharaoh took off his signet ring and he put it on Joseph's hand. And with that signet, whatever Joseph said was the law was law. And whatever Joseph commanded to be done would be done. And the Pharaoh said, only in the throne am I more powerful than you. Go and do all that God has put in your heart to do. Who is there that's wiser? Who is there with more integrity? A man or woman of integrity will come into the fullness of God's divine plan, your divine destiny, and you won't do it by being ambitious, and you won't do it by pleasing men, and you won't do it by going your own way, but you will do it by submitting yourself completely to God, humbling yourself and walking in total lo loyalty, total obedience to God. And being a man or woman of integrity, whether everything around you looks good or when everything around you looks like you are in a hard place, God is always with you. And if you are willing to walk in integrity, God will bring you out of the prison and he'll bring you into a palace. Joseph was 30 years old when he went into the palace to work for the Pharaoh. And in that place, he went up, 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 up. And everything that needed to be planned and everything that needed to be done, Joseph didn't just command someone else to do it. See, a man of, com of integrity, even when he's in a place of great authority, he doesn't become idle. He continues to work hard, to be diligent, because it doesn't work unto man, he works unto God. And so all those seven years, Joseph oversaw everything that needed to happen. He didn't just sit on a throne somewhere and tell everybody what to do. He was out there in the fields making sure that everything was happening according to God's plan. And it said that he gathered so much grain that he left off even counting because he filled so many storehouses and he had so much laying aside from those seven years of plenty that he couldn't even keep track of it anymore. God blessed the land of Egypt with seven very prosperous years. They kept one-fifth of what came in in the harvest all of those years. And when the famine came, 
There wasn't just enough food for Egypt, but there was going to be enough food for other nations as well because the famine covered the whole earth. And Joseph gathered very much grain and he prospered in the eyes of God. And he got married and he had two sons. Manasseh, and he said, I name him Manasseh for God has made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And then his second son, Ephraim, and he said, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. That is only possible when you walk in a life of integrity. Joseph could have compromised himself all along the way. He could have given Potiphar's wife what she wanted, and maybe he would have gotten away with it. Maybe he would have stayed as the primary servant in Potiphar's house forever. Maybe everybody would have kept his secret, but he would have lost his walk with God. He would have lost his favor with God. He would have compromised his character and his conduct to the point where God couldn't work in his life and he couldn't know God anymore. He could have been ambitious in the prison. And when Pharaoh came to get him, he could have said, I'm the solution you need. Put me in a place of authority. I know what to do. But he never compromised himself. He never sought personal promotion. He always humbled himself before God. And God lifted him higher and higher and higher into the place where he went from being the rejected, hated brother into a prison and then to change a whole nation and to be used by God to change the world. There is no limits to what God can do through one man or woman of integrity, but it means being patient. It means keeping your eyes on God. It means sometimes even walking the hard road when it looks like other people are bypassing you and they're getting to go places easier than you. Look, if you're not willing to pay the cost for God to do a lasting, rooted work in you that is going to keep you accountable to him in all things, then you're going to limit the move of God in your life. You will never walk in the fullness of your divine destiny if you don't choose to be a man or woman of integrity, one that works hard, that is totally obedient to God, that is loyal to him in all things, that does not compromise to please man. Joseph walked the hard road and God promoted him to a place of great authority and God saved many nations that would have perished if Joseph had compromised. Your contribution to this world is great when you put yourself in God's hands. Luke 16, 10 reads this way, one who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much and one who is dishonest in a very little is also dishonest in much. The world would tell you if you make little compromises, you can get what you want. But little compromises never stay little. They always grow and become big. But if you walk in integrity in little things and honor God where you are today, not seeking the bigger place, not seeking the more money, not seeking greater recognition from the people in the world around you, but instead you live to honor God and to bring him glory, God will promote you. And because you are faithful in a little, he will know that he can trust you with more and more. And God is looking for real kingdom builders. And real kingdom builders are always men of women in integrity because their life has longevity and it has purpose, lasting kingdom, eternal purpose. Integrity begins with who you are in your heart. Philippians 4, 8 reads, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. A man or woman of integrity walks out every step with intention wanting to bring God consistent glory through their life. And that's what led Joseph from the prison to the palace. Well, that's all the time that we have for this week. Join us next week for our fifth lesson, our last lesson on integrity. Until then, walk out a life of integrity with God and see how God will promote you and bring you into a grander place for his glory and for the fullness of his blessing on your life. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. 
We look forward to studying the Word with you again next time. In the meantime, if you want to check out any of our other video teachings, podcasts, daily devotional blogs, or to access the Melissa Silvis Ministries event calendar, you can friend us on Facebook at Melissa Silvis or at Melissa Silvis Ministries to the Nations with Love. You can also check out more information about our ministry by going to melissasilvis.com. May God bless you as you continue to seek Him every day.